Well, amen. I'm amazed at how many of these choirs and ensembles and bands can do so well. And Greg, just sit down there. I think I know how we'll divide the love offering, Brother Greg. I'm going to give you all the love. No, you have already know how I feel about him. What a wonderful Tuesday night crowd. You know, in a lot of meetings, Tuesday night is the lowest attended night. I don't know why. It must be in the Bible somewhere, but, but you've kind of broken the rule tonight. This is a great, great crowd, and thank you so much for coming. And by the way, if you have to miss a single night of this revival meeting, whatever you do, don't miss Oh, tomorrow night will be our final night together, and uh, so I, I hope you'll be here. I plan to be here, and we're going to do just fine in the presence of the Lord. I spoke to your senior adult group this morning. We had over 80 there today, and boy, had a wonderful time. I never saw, I didn't know there were that many soups you could eat, and they just had a long line of pots of soup and chili and all the mixings, and it was just so so very, very good, and I enjoyed speaking to them, and then tonight we have this opportunity. Now, before I preach, I, I want to ask you to do something, all right? I want you to take your right hand and put it out in front of you just like that in a fist. Just make a fist and put it right out in front of you. Now, go ahead. You're not too old to do it. Go ahead. Now, take your left hand and put it up above your right hand like this, and now bring it down on top of your left hand. Now, let me tell you what you've just done. You've just lowered your umbrella. Listen, I've been preaching 60 years, and I know Baptists pretty well. We come to church, we put up our umbrellas, and everything the preacher says bounces off to the next person. But I want you to know tonight you have lowered your umbrella, and if I see you put it back up, I'll call you down. <laughs> because I'm not after the person next to you, I'm after you tonight. I want you to listen very carefully. Hey, tonight... Tonight could be the greatest night of your life since the day you got saved. And I, I'm not trying to build up it. I'm just telling you, tonight could be the greatest night of your life since the day you got saved. Because tonight you're going to have an opportunity to get rid of some things in your life that are just beating you down. Jesus said, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Remember that. Now, you've lowered your umbrella. Now, I want you to offer a prayer to the Lord. Now, don't say it out loud, but from your heart to God's heart, just, just make this prayer yours. Dear God, if you speak to my heart tonight... I will meet you in the altar. Okay? You've lowered your umbrella. You've offered that prayer to the Lord. If you speak to my heart tonight, I'll meet you in the altar. And now I want you to hear the word of God. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to first. No, that's what I spoke of this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Are you ready? He says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. I live in northwest Alabama. From my house to here is 320 miles. 
Where I live in northwest Alabama, there are two types of people. And I'm not talking about black and white or rich or poor or Auburn or Alabama fans. Where I live, there are just two kinds of people. There are city folks and there are country folks. All of my mother's people were city folks. All of my dad's people were country folks. I like country people. Now, country people, they're not any better than city people. But you don't ever have to tell them that. And city people are not any better than country people. And you have to remind them of that a lot. I like the way country people dress. I call it a dignified simplicity. I like the way country people cook. You'll never go anywhere in America and find a restaurant that advertises city cooking. <laughs> but everywhere you go, you see restaurants that advertise country cooking. I don't like quiche. That's sort of a sissy thing to me. <laughs> I like weenies and kraut and pinto beans and cream potatoes and cornbread. And if you've got it at the house, this will be a short sermon and I'll go home with you. <laughs> when I was a boy, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother Pittman, they lived out of Florence, Alabama, about 15 miles on the Waterloo Road. You came to a gravel road and you turned left onto that gravel road and then the gravel ended and it became a dirt road and you kept going. And after you'd gone about 300 more yards, you came to the old house that my grandma and grandpa Pittman lived in, my great-grandparents. It was an old-timey house. They don't build houses like it anymore. Part of the house was here and part of the house was here and had a roof over the whole thing and a great big hole all the way through. They call those dog trot houses. I guess back then people must have thought an awful lot of their dog. I mean, God forbid the dog would have to walk around the house. So you just knock the middle out and let him walk through. An old clapboard dog trot house. After Grandpa Pittman died, uh, today you know that we have assisted living centers and a lot of nursing home facilities and a lot of places where a senior adult can go if they cannot take care of themselves anymore. But when I was a boy, we didn't have those things. And Grandma Pittman, a number of the family members tried to get her to leave that old house and come and live with them, and she wouldn't do it. She'd been born in that house. She'd gotten married in that house. She'd given birth to all of her children in that house, and she was determined to die in that house, and eventually she did. But when she got down and could not no, any longer take care of herself, uh, the family put a little money together and hired a lady by the name of Mrs. Fowler to go and live in with my great-grandmother. Now, Mrs. Fowler was probably about as old as my great-grandmother, but she could still get around and do some house cleaning and cooking. And so she moved into that old dog trot house with my great-grandmother to be her primary caregiver. Ms. Fowler was a country woman, and she was country before country was cool. <laughs> I mean, she was a pure country woman. She wore her hair pulled up on top of her head into a bun, and it was pulled up so tight, when I was a boy, I thought, man, if one hair sprang loose, it would knock her down. <laughs> Miss Fowler wore those old uh, dresses that she had made from her own hands from cloth that used to be flour sacks. Now, now, you don't know a thing in the world about that. But when I was a boy, flour came in cloth sacks. And those sacks came in colors and in patterns, and if you saved enough of those flower sacks, you could make a blouse or a dress or a shirt, and so all of her dresses were flower sack dresses that she'd made from those sacks. 
She always wore stockings, but she would always roll them down just beneath her knee. And every time she crossed her leg, you'd see that big brown rib of stocking there. And it always tickled me, but I never laughed. I was afraid of her. <laughs> Miss Fowler didn't wear any makeup at all, except for those two brown streaks that ran down <laughs> both sides of her mouth. And I don't believe it was Avon. I believe it was Garrett. <laughs> and for this crowd, that's snuff, all right? <laughs> Miss Fowler could do something I've never seen anybody else that could do. And if you can do this, I wish you'd see me tonight after church. It will warm the cockles of my heart, I promise you, and bring back a wonderful childhood memory. Ms. Fowler could draw her lips in and curl her chin up and her chin would touch her nose. Now, she didn't have a tooth in her head, and that might help to accomplish that. I don't know. But if you can do that, I wish you'd see me tonight. We won't do it out here in front of God and everybody. We'll, we'll find us a room somewhere, and just the two of us, and, and I'll enjoy it a lot. Miss <laughs> Fowler lived by a very simple country philosophy. No matter what kind of day it was, her response was, well, you know, the Bible says every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I had no idea what that meant. But Ms. Fowler said it was in the Bible, so I assumed it was okay. It was important. It could be a beautiful day with sun shining and birds singing and flowers blooming. And Miss Fowler would say, well, you know, the Bible says every tub shall sit on its own bottom. Or it could be a terrible day with tornadoes coming through and houses toppling over. And she would say, well, you know, the Bible says every tub shall sit on its own bottom. So I grew up believing the Bible said every tub shall sit on its own bottom. Well, I came to understand the Bible does not say that. That's not in the Bible at all. I preached this message at the Northwest Florida Baptist Convention a little while ago, and a lady came up to me after the service. She was about four feet tall, about four feet wide, about 85 years of age, and she came up to me and poked her finger right in my belly button and said, Preacher, you lied tonight. And I said, well, ma'am, I certainly didn't intend to. What did I say that wasn't true? You said the Bible does not say every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I said, oh, no, ma'am, the Bible, it doesn't say that. She said, yes, it does. I have read it for myself. And I said, well, ma'am, I tell you, my wife and I, we've been married over 50 years now, so I don't date much anymore. <laughs> But I tell you, you go home tonight and you find that in the Bible and you come back tomorrow night. And when the service is over, you and I are going to paint the town red. We'll go to the movie. We'll go to a restaurant. We'll do whatever you want to do. You just find it. She said, well, you just get ready. And she waddled off. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, I hope that's not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she came back the next night and she said, Preacher, they just don't print Bibles like they used to. <laughs> well, you know, the truth is, I did find out where it came from. If you've ever read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in that book he makes the statement, Every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I still have no idea what it means, but I know where it came from. Sometimes we think the Bible says things that it doesn't really say. Like every tub shall sit on its own bottom. Or here's one. You know, the Bible says God won't ask you to do the impossible. Oh, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Well, that's quite a lot to ask of a man who'd been dead for four days. 
Sometimes we hear it, well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says God helps those that help themselves. The Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that God helps those who cannot help themselves. That's how we got saved to start with. We couldn't save ourselves, and so he saved us. Well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says charity begins at home. Now, that's usually quoted by people that don't want to give to the evangelist love offering. But it's not in the Bible. Well, Brother Bob, you know the Bible says God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. The Bible didn't say that. William Cowper said that in a poem. Well, Brother Bob, you know the Bible says spare the rod, spoil the child. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says he that spareth the rod hateth the child. And that's much, much different. Sometimes we think the Bible says things that it doesn't really say. Now, you may have never heard a single one of those little pithy sayings that I just ran through, and it doesn't matter because none of them are very important. But I'm going to give you one more. And while you may not have ever heard any of these others, I promise you you've heard this one. And not only have you heard this one, most of you in the room believe that it's true but it's not true. And most of you who believe that it's true are sure you can find it in the Bible, but you cannot because it's not in the Bible and it is not true. And I'm fixing to give it to you. But when I give it to you, don't say amen because that'll let everybody in the house know you've not been listening. Because this is not in the Bible, and it is absolutely false. But you've heard it. You probably believe it. But it's not true, and it's not in the Bible. Don't say amen. I've warned you twice. Your own ignorance is at stake now. (laughs) We think the Bible says, but it doesn't. We think it's true, but it's not. This little statement. God won't put more on you than you can bear. I can see some of you kind of bristling up. Well, Brother Bob, I've heard that all my life. I know you have. Brother Bob, I've had Sunday school teachers say that. I know you. Brother Bob, I've heard preachers say I know you have. I have too but it is absolutely false. God will put more on you than you can bear. Now, some of you are thinking about a verse over there in in 1 Corinthians where the Bible says, no temptation shall come your way, but that God will provide a way of escape. Now, listen, that's temptation. Temptation is an enticement to do evil. And any time you are tempted to do evil, if you'll seek God, he will give you a way of escape. He will. But in this verse, in this passage that I've read tonight, Paul is not talking about temptation. He's talking about trouble. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia. So I want to talk to you tonight very briefly about the truth about trouble. Number one, trouble, Paul talks about the reality of trouble. Trouble is real. And when you became a Christian, God did not give you a get out of trouble free card. As God's people, we are not exempt from trouble. Trouble is very real. The book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job says, man that is born of woman, and you'd have to think a long time to figure out another way to get here. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, Paul doesn't tell us what the trouble was there in Asia. And that's kind of unusual for the Apostle Paul. 
Because most of the time when Paul talks about the trouble that he was in, he tells us what the trouble was. Paul says five times he was beaten with the scourge. He was whipped with the scourge, 40 stripes, less one. That means on five different occasions, he was whipped with that scourge and it came down on his back 39 times. That means 195 times that thing had ripped his back apart. That scourge was the cat of nine tails, had a handle about 18 inches long, flowing off of one end were nine leather straps. And embedded in those straps were pieces of bone and metal and stone. And when it came down on your back, not only did the leather straps whip you, those particles embedded in the straps would rip your flesh apart. If you and I could have seen the back of the Apostle Paul, it would have looked like he had gone through a meat grinder because it had been ripped apart so many times. Paul said, three times I was beaten with rods. Paul said, at Lystra, they stoned me and dragged me out of the city and left me for dead. So usually when Paul talked about his trouble, he told us what it was, but whatever this was, it was so awful, he doesn't describe it. He just says, I don't want you to be informed. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know that while we were in Asia, we were in real, real, real trouble. The reality of trouble. The second thing I want you to see is the intensity of trouble. Paul describes this trouble that he was in. He says he was pressed out of measure. That's in that verse. Pressed out of measure. In the language of the New Testament, that's a picture. It's a picture of a little donkey. And God made donkeys, amen? They don't grow on trees. God made donkeys. And he made them not to be house pets, if you've got a donkey at home in your house as a pet, you, you need help. <laughs> it's just, you're just not right. I'm sorry. God made donkeys to be beasts of burden. And a little donkey will stand in place. And you can pile on the weight and 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 he won't buck and he won't bray. He'll stand right there doing what God made him to do. But eventually you can put so much weight on that little donkey that the bones in his legs will begin to splinter and then they will crumble and down he will go neath the weight of the load. That's what Paul said. Paul said the trouble that came to us in Asia was so intense that it crushed us. It crushed us. And then he adds this phrase, above strength. You know how we Baptists are. We got a slogan for everything. Man, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, just suck it up and keep on trucking. Paul said, hey, I'd sucked up everything I could suck up. The truck died. There was nothing else. We were totally wasted, totally spent. All of our energy, all of our strength was gone. There was nothing left. Pressed out of measure, above strength. And then he adds this phrase, in so much that we despaired even of life. Do you know what the word despair means? It means to lose all hope. Paul said the trouble that came to us in Asia, it crushed us robbed us of all of our strength, nothing left. And it took away our hope. Now, folks, you have to understand, that's a big, big deal. If I were to say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I've lost all hope, you'd say, well, uh, Brother Bob lost his hope. That's bad, isn't it? Let's go home and watch the debate. But when the Apostle Paul says, he lost all hope. 
That's very significant. Because in the New Testament, Paul is the apostle of hope. Not every time, but almost every time you read the word hope in the New Testament, you read it because Paul wrote about it in one of his epistles. Paul said more about hope than James and Peter put together did. Paul said more about hope than the four gospel writers said. Paul said more about hope than Jesus said. You and I as Christians are people of hope. We have hope. And we have it because the apostle Paul wrote about it in the New Testament. But Paul said the trouble that came to us it crushed us, took away all of our strength and robbed us of our hope. You see, trouble can be very, very severe. But then the last thing I want to share with you, we see the reality of trouble and the intensity of trouble, but I want you to see the purpose of trouble. Why do bad things happen to God's people? You know, it's not hard to explain why bad things happen to ungodly people. It's not hard. It's not hard to explain why, why a, a drunkard has all the trouble and dies of cirrhosis of the liver. That's not hard to Explain. It's not hard to explain how a young lady who sells her body on the streets grows old years and years before she should and then dies of drug addiction. It's not hard to explain why bad things happen to ungodly people. But why do bad things happen to God's people? And that's where verse 9 comes in. Paul says, but we had this sentence of death in ourselves. Now, that's how Paul summarizes what he's just talked about in verse 8. Paul said, while we were in Asia, unbelievable, unbearable trouble came upon us, worse than being scourged, worse than being beaten with rods, worse than being stoned and left for dead. And he said, it crushed us. It robbed us of all of our strength and took away our hope. He says it was like God had passed a death sentence on them. That's what he said. It was like God passed a death sentence on them. But we had this sentence of death in ourselves that, oh, that's an important word. It means in order that. God let all of this happen to us. Listen, God will let you experience things that he hates so that he can accomplish in you things that he loves. We had this death sentence from God so that we would stop trusting in our selves. One lady came to me this morning in the noon, at, at the senior adult luncheon, and she said, Brother Bob, God's been dealing with my heart lately, and God revealed to me that I had a problem with pride. Hey, that's what Paul's talking about. Paul said, I had this death sentence so that I would stop trusting in myself. You know, it's kind of ingrained in us, especially those of us who live here in the South, you know. It's kind of ingrained in us from the day we're born that you're going to be man enough and you're going to be woman enough and you're going to be tough enough and you're going to be macho enough and you're going to be strong enough. You can handle anything. And sometimes we think that even as Christians. Hey, I can handle this. Nothing's going to come on me that I can't handle. I'm tough. I'm strong. I'm mighty. 
I'm a super Christian. <laughs> and God said, all right, let's see. And God, as long as you're willing to try to make it through your... If you say, I'm tough enough, I'm sharp enough, I'm strong enough, I'm powerful enough, I'm intelligent enough, I can solve it, I can work it out. And God says, okay, let's see. And then trouble comes. And we realize we're really not as smart as we thought we were, not as strong as we, we're not as creative. We don't have the ingenuity we thought we had. I was a pastor for 33 years before I entered this gypsy life. And as a pastor, sometimes folks would come in to want me to counsel with them. And many, many times, this is what I heard from different people. Brother Bob, I have come to the end of my rope. And every time, without exception, my response was, good. And they didn't like that. Sometimes they got a little angry. Brother Bob, you didn't understand what I said. I, oh, yeah, I understood what you said. Well, I told you I've come to the end of my rope, and you said, good. Why is it good? Because if you've come to the end of your rope, that's where God's been waiting for you to get. As long as you think you're man enough, woman enough, tough enough, smart enough, creative enough, God will say, go ahead. But when you come to the end of your rope, and that's where Paul was. He said we were crushed. We had no strength. We'd lost all hope. We'd come to the end of the rope. And he said we had this death sentence over us in order that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Listen to me. It is not true, it is not true, it is not true that God won't put more on you than you can bear. But what is true is this, God will never put more on you than he can bear. An old, old song I used to say I haven't heard it in 50 years, and I hadn't until last week. And at the Bible conference last week in Conroe, Texas, the group that had been brought in to do the music, they, they sang this old song. Now, they put a little sway to it, and that's okay. But it's an old, old, old song. You've probably not heard it in years. Some of you have never heard it. It says, if the world from you withhold of its silver and it's gold, and you have to get along with me, you're fair. Just remember in his word how God feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. The chorus says, leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you'll trust and never doubt, God will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And Paul said, God showed us in Asia why bad things happen to his children because he wants us to stop trusting in what we can do and start trusting in what he can do. Some of you have been carrying around some kind of a burden, maybe for a long time. Some of you have a wayward son or a wayward daughter, and you've just cried yourself to sleep every night, maybe for years. And tonight, in this invitation, you're going to have an opportunity to bring that burden to the Lord and leave it here. Now, don't bring it down here and then pick it up and take it back. 
All of your crying hadn't done a bit of good. All of your talking hadn't done a bit of good. But tonight, I'm asking you to roll that burden on him. And he said, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Maybe there's a problem at work and it's just beating you down. You hate to get up in the morning and go to work. Why don't you bring that burden to the Lord tonight? Maybe some of you have a, young people have a mother or a dad and they make your life kind of tough. They're not saved and they don't care anything about your spiritual life. And maybe you just wanted to run away from home. Listen, listen. That's a burden God doesn't want you to bear. You bring that to him tonight and just let him do what he does. And oh, I'm telling you, God is big. There's no problem too hard for him to solve. There's no prayer too hard for him to answer. There's no person too hard for him to save. I'm telling you, you bring that burden tonight to the Lord. Brother Bob, I've been to the doctor. And he spoke that ugly, ugly word. I never thought I would hear it. But he said, I have cancer tonight. Why don't you bring that to the Lord? Well, Brother Bob, if I bring my burden tonight to this altar and I leave it there with him, does that mean that it's not going to be a problem anymore? No, it just means it's not your problem anymore. It's his. And hey, he's smart enough. He's tough enough. He's creative enough. He can take care of it. I told you, next to the day you got saved, this can be the greatest night of your life. Because God is giving you an opportunity tonight to roll upon him a burden that you've been carrying that he never intended for you to carry. But now you've heard the truth. God will put more on you than you can bear. You've known that, but you just didn't want to believe it. But believe it, he will. Not because he's mean, but because he loves you. And he loves you so much, he will allow that which he hates to come to your life so that he can accomplish in you that which he loves. A child that is totally dependent upon him. So that's the invitation tonight. Bring your burden to the Lord and leave it here I did not see one umbrella go back up so I know you've heard and I'm never naive enough to believe that everybody in every service hears from God I know that's not true but some of you God spoke to you I'm not a novice I've been preaching over 60 years I know when God is in the house and I know when he's not and I know when God is speaking and God has spoken to some of you tonight you didn't come maybe expecting to hear anything like this but God has spoken to you and you remember what you prayed Lord if you speak to my heart tonight I'll meet you in the altar and just come bring whatever that burden is and when you go back to your seat, when you go out of this building tonight, you'll recognize immediately that a burden has been lifted. The problem is not solved yet, but it's no longer your burden. It's his. It's his. Father, Lord, I've done my very best to take these two verses and open them up and apply them And Lord, I know there's some here tonight, they've just been beaten almost to death. 
because of burdens that they've been carrying. And I pray that tonight they'll come and experience the freedom we sang about earlier in the service. And those burdens be rolled away from them and on to you. And Lord, you can handle them. You can take care of them. We trust you with them. So I pray that people now would respond. Lord, if anybody needs to be saved, I pray they would come and tell Brother Larry or one of the pastors, I'm lost, I need Jesus. If anybody needs a church home, I pray they'd come, move their membership. But Lord, tonight you've led me to talk to your children and explain to them from your word why bad things come in our lives. And so God, these are your children, most of them are yours. And I pray they would respond to you as a loving father who invites them to come, bringing their burdens and cares and casting them on you. And Lord, when they leave the altar, don't let them pick them up and carry them back to the seat. Leave them here. Lord, let them leave them here. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready? Hey, never be another time quite like this. You come on right now, will you? That's right. Come on. I hear the same. 